So the last question I want to ask you is about peer review. This is one of those right. buzzwords that gets thrown around in the media all the time that right. you know, scientists throw it around all the time. And it's supposed to immediately give this feeling of oh, legitimacy, oh, professionalism, oh, truth when you drop the words right. peer review. So we have peer review in theory. Can you tell me a bit about peer review in practice? Is peer review what people make it out to be? as this, this marker of when you get the stamp of peer review, that means, oh, well, the, this is practically truth. <laughs> right. Okay. This is a complicated subject, and I'll, I'll try to touch on a few main points. Um, peer review, this is sort of like the quote about Winston Churchill earlier. Um, it certainly is better to have your manuscript rigorously reviewed by a genuine peer Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're talking about a top journal, typically those editors are very good about trying to select people who will uh, give a very serious scrutiny of your paper before it's, it's published. That doesn't mm -hmm. guarantee that what you've published is reliable. But when peer review is working properly, it is indeed a very important quality control mechanism. Mm -hmm. The problem is the difference between theory and practice. In some cases, peer review works and it helps and it filters out some of the bad stuff. But there's a couple issues here. One, there's a proliferation of these open access journals that are, are so-called predatory journals. There are some quality open access journals, and there are some that are set up in remote areas of China with addresses and vague places and made up editorial boards that will print anything that they get, and, and they'll just take author's fees. And so they, that, those are not you know, adequately peer-reviewed in any way. That's mm -hmm. just basically academic fraud. Um, so that's a problem. You might have a paper that looks like it's in a, a, a you know, a, a real journal, but it's 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 just nonsense that somebody published in one of these uh, predatory journals. Mm -hmm. And then there's this gray area in the middle, <clears throat> which is that peer review in practice has uh, lots of problems. Uh, I'll just name a few of them. Richard Smith, who used to be the editor of uh, the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, a very influential journal, was very concerned to figure out how reliable peer review was. I mean, the thing about science that's fun is you can apply science to the process of science. Mm -hmm. You can say, well, let's do a study on the efficacy of peer review. And so one way of doing this, quite simply, is to take a manuscript, embed lots of errors in it, and send it out to you know, <laughs> the sorts of peer reviewers who would typically handle it and see how many of them notice the errors. And Brilliant. very often you find that they don't. The rate of, of error catching is disturbingly low. Here's another issue about peer review. Um, I, I've been a, an associate editor for different journals or a guest editor, and so I've had the, the, the position of receiving a manuscript, and then I'm the one who decides who do I send this out to. You know, mm. I've got to find the peer reviewers. So, so I've, I have a kind of inside look at what this is like. Well, when I read the paper, if it, particularly if it's in a contentious area, I'm, I'm going to form a judgment about it right away. And it's not that I have some sort of dispassionate algorithm that I go use to help me select the most qualified reviewers who don't have a stake in the game or something like that. I, I make a judgment. If I think that the paper really shouldn't be published, whether I'm doing this consciously or unconsciously, I'm more likely to pick a peer reviewer that I have a good hunch is going to sink the paper mm. because I kind of know what they would argue about this case. Mm. Or I kind of know that they would say that you know, these methods aren't sufficient to prove the point. Whereas if I like the paper and it's, it, I, I think it's something that should be published, mm -hmm. again, there's, there's not some magical objective formula that takes place here, but I'm going to send it to somebody who I think will give the paper its best shot. So this is just an example of the decision-making that goes on in associate editors' minds. Now, again, associate editors at good journals that have good reputations for good reason really try to do their best to get you know, maybe one review from somebody who's likely to be sympathetic to the article, another one from somebody who's likely to be critical. Then they try to synthesize between these different things and really come up with a, a well-informed judgment about whether they should or shouldn't publish the paper. So that's the ideal scenario, and that does happen. And again, part of what the trick is going to be going forward is helping people identify which journals are indeed uh, uh, using good practices, mm. which journals are having a rigorous uh, peer review process that really is a, a good quality control mechanism. So I don't want to suggest that it doesn't exist, but I do want to suggest that there's a lot of room for politicking in, in mm. peer review, um, where especially when you're in a politicized area, uh, you know, if the, if the associate editor of the journal has a certain attitude, they know who they can call up for a, a peer review. Um, it's, it's, it's not done uh, in any sort of purely dispassionate way. I don't even know how it would be done in such mm. a way. Um, so, so just because something's got a, a stamp of peer review, uh, that, that again, is, it's, it's a piece of information. Um, if, a, if, if a paper is peer reviewed at a really good journal and that journal has a good track record of publishing stuff that sort of bears out over time, then I maybe give a little more credence to the fact that it was peer reviewed at that journal. Mm -hmm. um, but I shouldn't just take the mere fact of something being peer reviewed as evidence that it's therefore true or that it's passed some really strict test of, of reliability because 
extremely often that is not the case, and something can be peer reviewed, and uh, you know basic errors will slip through. For example, peer reviewers don't don't check the statistics uh, of authors, so they 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 just don't have the time, they, and they also don't read every reference uh, included in the reference section. Right? How could because, you? Because uh, peer reviewers aren't paid to do this. It's all done as a favor to the sort of academic community. And so if somebody sends a peer reviewer a manuscript, and it's uh, 50 pages long, and there's 100 references. Um, they're just trusting the author to have cited references that are the appropriate citations that sufficiently support the claim. Mm. Now, if you're a specific expert in a specific area, you'll be able to identify whether the references are the right references or not. But very often, peer reviewers are sort of a little bit more generally knowledgeable about the field, but they may not know the specific issue, mm -hmm. and, and they're sort of giving it a, a, a quality check uh, to the best of their ability, but they might miss these sorts of things, particularly if somebody has an agenda and they're submitting papers and using citations improperly. Uh, which does occur. Um, similarly, there's, in almost no cases do they rerun the statistics. Uh, mm. So they just take the statistics at face value. They hope that the researchers have done due diligence, and what they're looking for is sort of obvious signs of design flaws or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they may very well catch them, and, and in many cases, properly uh, motivated peer reviewers do a very good job of saying this paper just shouldn't be published. It's not rigorous. Um, the paper might then go on to be published in, in a, a so-called lower-ranked journal. So just because it's rejected at a top journal doesn't mean it's not going to be published elsewhere, mm. very often with the very same flaws. So, you know, and that would count as a quote unquote peer reviewed paper, even though the first person who maybe was the real expert said it shouldn't be published. Mm. So that happens all the time. You know, if I put in all the effort to uh, put a manuscript together just because it got rejected at the top journal doesn't mean I'm not going to file it away. I'm going to keep going down the totem pole until I find a journal that accepts it. Now, hopefully I've taken the criticism and tried to improve it and so on. But many authors don't do that. They just go down the line and wait till somebody accepts it. Um, flaws and all. And, and that happens uh, again all the time. Now, do you think there should be something like, um, getting compensated for professional peer review? Do you think that would correct some of the, the problems? Peer review has to be revolutionized. Uh, peer review is, is uh, on balance, an extremely unreliable quality control mechanism right now, again, with lots of exceptions and you know some people doing good work. But on the whole, peer review, uh, first of all, it's very slow. So if I have a paper and I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm an expert in the area, I've actually done good work, and I'm pretty sure I've done good work, and then I submit it to the journal and it gets held up for six months when really – it, you know, people should be able to see that and use that. So authors are now doing things where they'll put what are called preprints of their papers on certain repositories. So mm -hmm. while it's being reviewed, they have a draft of it that's available. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not reviewed yet, but other people in the community can just decide whether it's useful. You know, they don't need to have those two reviewers that some associate editor happened to find were available that week to mm -hmm. do the review. Um, and then maybe they're on vacation, so they give it to the graduate student to do or something, which again happens regularly. So, um, you know, the fact that the two people that you managed to get to do the paper are somehow the be-all and end-all arbiters of whether it's a good paper, <laughs> that's crazy. If you, if you put it in an online uh, uh, venue, you, you can let the community decide. They can read the paper and see if there are any flaws. If you had, you know, 150 eyes on your paper rather than two eyes, um, that's, that's going to be much more likely to, to give you valuable feedback, and people mm -hmm. are going to be able to say, listen, why did you run that test instead of that test? Or show me your open data so that I can rerun these statistics. Or mm -hmm. you know, here's a way you could improve your argument in this passage. So, so something more like crowdsource peer review among mm -hmm. you know, experts who cross a certain threshold of qualification to be able to comment on a paper or something like that uh, is where the future is going to be. Because the idea that, that two people should be the deciders in chief of every paper that comes out just creates a huge bottleneck and completely mm -hmm. slows science down, sometimes years. Um, and I think that's also completely unacceptable.